As I have the fingers of judgment prepared, we need to talk about Bethesda Studios' first IP in 25 years, their first new universe, although space exploration definitely takes a backseat to that typical Bethesda formula, which isn't a huge deal for me. In fact, I had a great time during my playthrough. If you go into this thinking this is Star Citizen, this is going to be some kind of space simulator, you're going to feel like you're Neilio Armstrong. Probably not. You're probably going to be waiting another 10 years for Star Citizen, but if you want to feel that core DNA tingle in your gamer bones, and for a lot of gamers, by the end of your playthrough, you're going to be thinking this is exactly exactly what I needed to scratch that Bethesda itch. Bethesda has officially announced that they are working on Elder Scrolls 6. Kind of hoping it'd be a Fallout game, as I personally do like the Fallout series more than the Elder Scrolls series, but I play them both, enjoy them both. Great, you've got my background. I like Bethesda games. But there are certainly cons or shortcomings with this title. It is by no means perfect. So that was my first notation there, was just the set expectations. If you're looking for that Bethesda games formula, but with a space setting, you've, you've got it here. But if you're looking for a space simulator where you can run from one end of a barren planet to the other, or you can actually fly your ship through the ozone layer, smacking through the crust into these planets and stuff. None of that exists. Sick. We've set our expectations. Are there going to be any spoilers in this video? Are you going to ruin the story for me? There's going to be one slight spoiler in the means of a gameplay mechanic. However, if you already watched the Bethesda showcase from two months ago that showed cinematics as well as gameplay, then you already know that this exists. It's coming at you in a couple of seconds, so get ready for it. Surprise, motherfucker. You have powers. Although everything I'm going to mention has already been talked about by Bethesda themselves two months ago in that showcase. So if you've seen that already, Already. These spoilers don't exist for you. There are those little tidbits. All the B-roll or gameplay you're going to be seeing is mostly combat, shipbuilding, base building, or little story tidbits like NPCs talking but not giving up any dialogue pieces. Heavily story related, it's going to be so vague as to how you even got there or how it all ties in together. I'm really not trying to spoil anything for you because I want you to enjoy it for yourself. And the last caveat before I get into actually reviewing this title is the fact that there is going to be a separate story review that is just going to be littered, loaded with spoilers. The whole video is a spoiler itself. It's going going over the entire story start to finish in my opinion on it. Reason for that being, I want to talk about the story because it starts pretty good, it lays the foundation for what could have been a kick-ass story, and it's not terrible by any means, but by the mid to end of the story, it definitely dabbles into Hideo Kojima levels of confusion. Hideo Kojima, you uncultured swine. By getting overly vague and open-ended and not really giving you any answers, even when you have the option to ask for more information, you know, explain it to me in layman's terms, break it down to me like a big dumb dummy, it's still kind of like, well, the universe is what you make it. What do you picture that this could be? And it's like, why don't you just tell me what I'm what I'm looking at here? I'm going to do a general spoiler free overview of the story, but I am going to do a separate video grading, putting a grade or number on that story and explaining why I give it that grade it's just loaded with spoilers and whatnot. No spoilers in this video, though, besides the fact you have powers, but we all knew that price platform. And where can you play this son of a gun? You can play it on Game Pass. Unfortunately, Ultimate raised its price from 15 to 17 dollars a month recently. But with Game Pass, you can play this game. Everyone can play it now. However, if you shoveled an additional $30 on top of your Game Pass subscription like I did, you could have played it for the last six days. I personally think that was $30 hell of well spent because I've wasted $30 on stupid shit. You know, meals that didn't taste good. It was cold and whatnot. A shirt that didn't fit me good. Actually, I hardly ever would spend $30 on a shirt. That seems expensive. 30 bucks for early access. Fuck yeah. Now, if you don't have Game Pass because you think it's whack or you just, just don't like it or whatever, you can buy it for $70 on Steam. Just comprehending paying $70 for this title when you can just play it on the Game Pass subscription. I understand if, if you're not going to make use of that subscription service, then it makes more sense to just buy the upfront cost of the game. Damn, well, I must have got it on sale for 30 bucks flat or it's $31. It's actually $35 now for the premium edition upgrade. However, the main point of the premium edition upgrade was that you got early access, which now everyone can play the game if you want the content of the premium edition, which comes with this shit right here. Some in-game content. The Constellation Skin Pack, which is for a laser rifle, spacesuit, helmet, and boost pack. You've got the digital art book and soundtrack, which anybody can look up for free on Google. The only value I found in the Premium Edition was that six days of early access. I mean, I've already beaten the main story, done a shitload of side content, and people are just now picking up the game. But paying $100 for just some in-game skins and stuff, not for me personally. Finally, we have to talk about the Constellation Edition, which is actual physical collectibles, a steel bookcase, the suitcase looking watch holder, which which has an actual pretty cool looking watch. I don't know if the build quality is any good, but it looks neato. And this is sold out pretty much anywhere, but if you can get your hands on it, it goes for $300, the price of a Series S console. Surprise, motherfucker. I'm going to give you a very vague, spoiler-free overview of the story. The year is 2330, and humanity has gone interstellar exploring new planets because resources are tapped out on Earth. Speaking of mining for resources, you're a miner in an area of space called the Settled Systems, who's tasked with the process of gathering and extracting minerals from a moon. In the early game tutorial, when you're learning the 
controls and explaining the back lore of the universe. You're doing your job cutting into a rock in a cave and you stumble upon a mysterious object and the entire story revolves around gathering these artifacts and bringing them back to a key location, a headquarters where you can talk about your discoveries with your crew, talk about the game plan for getting the rest of the artifacts and hopefully uncovering the mystery and power that they contain. And I'll mention this again later during the estimated time to beat as far as side quests, 100% completion, all that good stuff, but that story is going to take you between 30 to 40 hours. I'm seeing all kinds of crazy estimates going from like eight hours all the way to 60 hours, it, it, between 30 to 40 generally if you're trying to beeline the main story. Now, as far as the gameplay loop, I want to start with character movement because I think this is a big step up from previous Bethesda games where you felt like you had a lot of character weight and were pretty goddamn sluggish. Skyrim, you can't even sprint and then jump. You have to stop sprinting first unless you put on a mod. In third and first person, you are incredibly quick and snappy. I will say in third person, you do have more character weight. So if you're trying to snap around corners and peek and pop and do all that fun stuff, you're going to want to do that in first person. But movement overall feels very snappy, especially if you unlock the boost pack from the beginning, which I strongly recommend you do. And I can't even imagine just playing through this game without a boost pack going for like maybe a primitive caveman build, nothing but a shiv and a loincloth. You are going to feel so slow and limited when you're crossing these barren planets. And guess what? There's no land vehicles. Not having a boost pack on these planets where there's pretty much zero gravity and you can infinitely float and not touch the ground and cover a ton of ground quickly. I can't process not having a boost pack. Along those lines, I would recommend unlocking slide and increase oxygen so you can sprint to your heart's content if you're a movement buff. While this isn't Apex Legends, it definitely doesn't feel like any previous Bethesda titles movement wise. I really like that. Climbing. You will automatically grab onto ledges, although sometimes he just doesn't do it. You will not take fall damage if you hit your boost pack right before hitting the ground and suits and perks can also limit your fall damage. Side quests are a big part of the gameplay loop and they're actually very good and many times the writing is actually better than the main storyline and also much less confusing. Also, I will say the faction missions are fucking sick and you should focus on those as soon as you get to the story point where you get your powers. As for puzzles, there's really none to speak of other than a very repetitive and boring sequence where you're floating in a zero gravity dome to collect floating glowing lights, which you do over 10 times in this game and each time it lasts much longer than it should. I'm going to take a short break because my lawn is getting cut. Yes, I did used to cut my own lawn for many, many years, but when you can pay like $40 a month and I don't have to get my ass out there and sweat because it's 90 plus degrees because it's Florida and I can stay in here in the air conditioning and talk to y'all, I'm going to do it, but we need to take a break until they're done. This game has quite a few RPG mechanics, including full crafting benches. I will say the gun crafting does feel like a step back from Fallout 4, at least at surface value. I guess maybe I haven't spent as much time in it, but it seemed like most of the guns I put down on that bench didn't have as many components that I could customize. As for inventory management, I do like the fact that you can sort it by ammo type, weight, value, etc., but it is pretty damn terrible because you cannot see your inventory as well as somebody else's, a companion, a chest, a dead body that you're trying to loot, your ship's cargo. You have to tab between your inventory inventory and the inventory of whatever you're trying to interact with. So a vendor you're buying and selling with or whatever, and that sucks. So whenever you're looting a body and you're seeing what they have on them, you have to tab over to see what your carry weight currently is. It's, it's as for character level ups, you are on an XP system that will get you through levels and you do have a skill tree. I wish you could zoom out to see everything like you can in Fallout 4 where you can zoom out and just kind of see where everything is and be like, oh yeah, bottom right's where the perk is that I'm looking for. It'd be easier to navigate. Speaking of navigation, it is a lot easier on PC because you can click on the individual tabs at the top. As we're on controller, you have to use the bumpers to tab back and forth. I do like the way skills are handled where you have to do challenges. So you can't just dump a bunch of skill points into one perk and max it out. You actually have to utilize that play style and rank it up. So that's really cool. And some of these you can just grind out like sprinting to run out your oxygen, but some of them you'll actually need to do by playing the game. There's some unique activities in this game. A few random encounters, especially if you choose the perk where you're going to have random pirates come and try and fuck with you. But there is a very in-depth base building mechanic, which is pretty late game and does take a lot of resources, but it can be self-automated with crew members and is vulnerable to being attacked by creatures and raiders and can be upgraded over time. Think of it like the settlement building in Fallout 4, but it requires more resources and you can do more in it. But it's the same concept. You can assign crewmates to specific tasks. If you played a Bethesda RPG, you get the shtick. There is also a pretty kick-ass shipbuilding system, which can feel a little overwhelming at first. That's why I recommend sticking to the quick upgrade option rather than trying to attach individual parts, which you'll still need to do for some specific upgrades. And you're eventually going to want to learn the building mechanics, snapping on nodes or parts. But there is an upgrade path that you can take to upgrade the already installed parts on your ship. There is limited space exploration on foot. There's an entire section up next called Exploration. 
There's also resource farming, which is necessary for the base building and also could be fun, I guess, if you like just aiming a laser particle beam at a rock. There are loading screens aplenty in this game and space exploration isn't the primary focus. Rather, this is a Bethesda RPG set in a space time and setting. You can't fly into a planet directly. You have to go through multiple cutscenes and loading screens. And if you try to run from one end of a planet to the other, maybe land your ship and then loot back around, you can, or I sh should say will, hit an invisible boundary, which can be a little bit jarring, but we'll touch more on that in the next section because you might never see those invisible boundaries ever, depending on your playstyle. The character creator is very in-depth and I recommend taking your time here, especially picking the traits in your background. Cosmetics doesn't matter that much because you can go to a, basically a plastic surgeon and change up your look later. For my lady viewers, all six of you in the back row, there's only 10 ladies hairstyles and they're pretty damn cringe. A huge complaint of mine that's going to come into play through the general gameplay loop is there's no real land maps. It looks like an Assassin's Creed map before you break your spine into a hay bale to reveal the lay of the land. You can set an objective and then open your scanner and that puts arrows on the ground, which makes it pretty easy to get to your destination. And opening your scanner and looking around, you actually see specific landmarks that you have and have not visited. If you have visited them, you can actually fast travel directly from there. With a future update, I'd like to see actual maps because it does get very confusing running around these large cities like Neon and New Atlantis. Ma maps, please. I mean, <laughs> we shouldn't be fighting for maps. Another little gripe I had is your companion will ask you to talk out in the field a lot. Like, bro, can it wait till we're back at the lodge? My companion for pretty much my entire playthrough was Sam. I think he's a fantastic companion slash character, great voice actor, whatnot. But my mans will stop me damn near in the middle of a gunfight. Like, I'll just get done mopping the floor with an enemy, a team wipe, right? And then my bud will be whispering in my ear. He, I mean, he gets close to you and be like, when you get a chance, brother, I want to talk. And of course, I always just listen to him because it's great dialogue. And like I said, he's actually a pretty well written character and good companion and whatnot. There's also a pretty good side mission where you're accompanied by him and his daughter. But I noticed my companion stopped me to talk a lot, like the beginning of a mission and the end of a mission, at least. As for exploration, because I know this is a huge topic around this title, mostly people being let down that this isn't as in-depth of a space exploration title as people would have liked. There's 1,000 planets, 100 of which are advertised as being pretty damn populated and having things to see and do. But really, there's only a handful of major cities and settlements. And in such a vast galaxy, I expected more small towns, outposts, etc. The majority of random planets you see on your map can be landed on if they're not too hot, cold, or gaseous. And if there's minimal hostile fauna, plenty of resources, and you feel safe there, you can set up an outpost. Although the base building mechanic is somewhat late game and requires a lot of resources. Now the 900 planets, the 9 out of 10 planets that you can land on in this game, they're procedurally generated with random landmarks, which sometimes do clip into the camera kind of weird. It happened to me twice, not a big deal whatsoever. When you land on these planets, there's three to five POIs or points of interest that spawn out in the distance. You can run to them, or if you've already been there, you can use your scanner to aim at them and fast travel. Now, depending on your playstyle, you may never see an invisible boundary message telling you to fast travel to a new biome or a new quadrant of that planet. As most of the reviewers mentioning the message follow up with, I had to run in a straight line for 15 minutes to get this message. While this is wonderful for science and YouTube, unless you pass out with your finger on the left thumbstick, which I did fall asleep playing this game a couple of times, not because it's boring, which at sometimes it can be, but because I was staying up late grinding this mamma jamma. But in my 33 hours thus far, I have yet to see one of these boundary messages. I've seen other reviewers run into them, but again, they're testing the theory, so to speak. They're just running in a straight line, which you might accidentally run into one of those if you are playing it for that deep space exploration. But the reason I think the majority of people playing this game aren't even going to see those messages is because you're pretty much prompted to go to those three to five landmarks and there's nothing really imploring you to go anywhere else because it's, it's boring, bland, barren space, which in real life would be just like that because not all planets are going to be hospitable for life. So in that aspect, yeah, that's kind of realistic that some of the planets would be bland and boring as fuck, but there are limitations to this fast travel system. For example, you can't land on a planet and then truly explore wherever the hell you want, running from one side all the way back around to the other. You, you can't do that in this game. Also, if you want to strategically land outside of a major settlement to avoid a contraband check and then run your happy ass pedestrian style into the town square, you can't because you're going to hit one of those boundaries if you landed too far away. So that limits somebody's play style or strategy, trying to land outside of a major settlement and then run in to bring in contraband and sell it on the black market. You can't do that. And there is no black market. The state of exploration in Starfield didn't offend me because the way I've been playing it is like a Bethesda RPG that happens to be set in space. And I'm mostly doing side quests or raiding ships and caves, selling loot, upgrading gear, mollywop the main storyline. And none of that requires, implores, or even directs me to even want to go to any of those barren planets and run into any of those fast travel messages. 
challenges. I do think land vehicles being added to this game would have added so much. It would have been another mechanic where you could have customized them. Certain vehicles could go over certain terrain. It'd be a quick way to transport your crew around, run over aliens, and not feel inclined to fast travel so much once you discover that space exploration is in the cooking pot that's on the back burner. Hopefully you're looking for a fight because we're about to be talking about the combat system in this game. All the weapons look and sound amazing, super poppy, super fucking deep and loud, and they didn't sound hollow and tinny and like you have a Nerf gun in your hand. They also looked super original with that NASA punk style, and the sound design for each gun is drastically different indoors, which I thought was really cool. As for the enemy types, you've got bugs, monsters, people, and late game super baddies that I can't talk about. No comment. Okay. No comment. Okay. But I might flash a little bit of B-roll here and there if I'm feeling spicy. While it would have been nice to see some additional enemy types, I do feel like they were varied enough to where it didn't get necessarily stale, or at least not because of enemy types. As for bosses, again, I can't talk about it. Yeah, I'm not supposed to say it's official police business. I know, it's unfortunate. Generally, I covered the boss fights and whatnot, but uh, it's getting directly into spoiler territory, but I will be talking about it during that story video, that story review riddled with spoilers. I do have a couple of gripes with the combat, and the main one is that on normal difficulty, the enemy AI is almost dumb. You can run straight up to enemies, and sometimes they just stare at you for a second. And if you have a playstyle that's incredibly aggressive, where you're jumping and crouching and bobbing and weaving and sprinting around and rushing these enemies and stuff, it kind of like breaks them occasionally where they're like, oh, I didn't expect them to peek me from this angle. And it makes it really not that challenging because you can almost cheese the fight sometimes. Also, the enemies aren't very aggressive and don't work together as a team and try and flank you or push up or anything like that. However, what really just fucking absolutely sucks is that the TTK or time to kill is through the roof, especially early game. So enemies seem spongy. And I will say later when you get stronger weapons and you revisit some of the weaker enemies, you can just one tap the shit out of them. But the stronger enemies are getting progressively tankier as well. So enemies just generally seem spongy and tanky and not fun to rush up on and put down. Yes, this is because it's an RPG and enemies have stats. This isn't COD or Doom, but I shouldn't have to two mag a low level enemy with a pellet gun. There's also some weird hitbox detection on me, the, 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 the player, where I could have swore that I'm behind cover, but I'm getting pegged in my shoulder despite me not having line of sight with the enemy. Grenades work, but they take some getting used to, and I strongly recommend the perk that gives you a trajectory line and increases damage. It's the one that has a little grenade icon. Although you find a pretty scarce amount of nades and compared to something like Fallout 4 where I always had a stack of Molotovs or explosives in the back pocket. Fucking cat! <laughs> I really was just hoping for more nades. I couldn't really use them as I would have liked to, as the good lord intended. But when I did have them, I had a good time with them. Insert B-roll of nades, obviously. As for graphics, we're going to start with textures, which up close look pretty damn great. Off in the distance, there's a nice bokeh effect to the depth of field turned on. If you turn it off, there's still a bit of film grain, and everything off in the distance kind of looks softened, almost like it has a little fog or haze over it, especially on the Series S, which, by the way, handled this game incredibly well. More on that during the performance section. Overall, this game looked very good on the four devices I played it on, a high-end PC with everything cranked to ultra, obviously taking the cake, but even the Series S looked pretty damn impressive. In the ROG Ally handheld, I'm just glad to be able to play a game like like this on a handheld PC. It's it's low everything. You are at low everything. And you still have to taper the screen to 720p, not 1080, and then upscale with FSR, and it looks good. It's up 45 to 55 frames per second. The Steam Deck or ROG Ally is definitely not the ideal way to play this game. You can do it, and the fact that you can take it on the go, or even just sitting in bed with it right in front of you while you still have the TV on or whatever you're trying to do, it's a great experience. Handheld gaming, especially handheld PCs that we have nowadays. Something like this that's pushing it. It's, it's kooky to see how many people are like trying to play this on the Steam Deck and succeeding. I mean, they're playing it. It's just like, fuck, what, what do you, what settings are you on there, my friend? Mi amigo. As for lighting, this game doesn't offer ray tracing, so some surfaces may look unnaturally lit, but it's nothing to draw concern with. The flashlight does a great job of illuminating up dark corridors, and the starry sky looks amazing. Wet asphalt reflections on Neon City looks sick as fuck as well. As far as environments and vistas, I was also going to throw in art style, but since it's its own new thing, NASA Punk, it's got its own section up next. The few cities that do exist are very different from each other in styling, and are definitely worth exploring in their entirety, even going inside all the shops as vendors have different prices for different items and can sometimes have side quest information or give you rumors. The few cities that do exist, at least the major ones you're going to be visiting frequently, such as Neon City, New Atlantis, the old Western style one out in the middle of the desert, god damn it, starts with an A, Abaca, Abaca. I do believe you mean Aquila City, good sir. Aquila, Aquila, as in you got a weak Achilles. NPC facial animations, I'm going to throw this into graphics, and it is definitely hit and miss, but usually hit, at least in my experience. 
Sometimes the emotion is conveyed and other times NPCs say words, but the face doesn't live up to the usually amazing voice acting. I didn't get that funny bug where NPCs look at y'all bug-eyed when you walk by, but my girlfriend saw it on Xbox and I see it's pretty common. Every time I walk by a group of NPCs, they would look at me for a moment, then go back to what they're doing. And the conversations for the most part look pretty organic, pretty natural, and not video gamey, but occasionally NPCs will just be bland and emotionless, like some YouTubers where they just talk monotone. Just Starfield's a pretty good game, I guess. There's uh, planets and stuff. If you stare at NPCs for a prolonged period of time, you can see they aren't really carrying on a virtual life like you would see in Skyrim or Fallout, which I do believe they were quoted as doing, and they're, I guess they're supposed to, but I sure as shit didn't see them doing anything other than standing around talking to each other. One positive note, I didn't notice repeat character models nearly as much as something like Cyberpunk or Grand Theft Auto V, the same pedestrian NPC walking by, but I did notice a lot of NPCs wearing the same outfit, like right next to each other. I guess everyone shops at the same store. Lastly, I'll throw this into the graphics department because I don't know where else to shove it. In third person view, you run at kind of a weird angle, diagonally, diagon alley. It looks kind of weird. It's not all the time, but it's most of the time when you're in third person view. As for the art style, it's its new thing. It's the first time ever being implemented in a game or ever being incepted. It's called NASA Punk. Bethesda collaborated pretty closely with NASA to make sure all the gear and the space interiors looked real, like existing equipment, maybe a little bit more futuristic, but they didn't want to delve too deep into futuristic. And because of that, all the space gear looks real, like it could exist now or slightly in the future. Everything looks worn and like it's been used out in space. It looked fucking sick. Let me try and bust out my thesaurus and give you a better explanation than fucking sick. It's definitely original. It's unlike anything I've ever seen because it's never been implemented before. And yeah, there's other space games out there, but this is less futuristic and more of like space exploration now. And not just now, but also kind of like retro. Everything almost has like a retro like 70s theme. Even the logo with that multicolored stripe is a retro fang. I thought the art style was really neato Toledo. Also, it says in that fine print every time you boot up the game that there were maps provided for the moon and Jupiter and probably some other planets by NASA. So I'm assuming part of the planet design is based off the geography and layout of those actual planets. So that's that's pretty cool. As for audio design, the opening cave sequence, which I will say is a pretty boring way to drop you into the world compared to Fallout 4, where you're running for your life into an underground vault with your family, or Skyrim, where you're literally next in line to get beheaded by the executioner until a dragon rips shit apart in front of you. But that cave of disappointment for many was actually the first test of audio design for me as I stopped, took a deep breath, and listened to notice a lot of quiet ambient cave whistles. Sick, I felt like I was in there. Touched on it during combat, but all weapons have different sounds for indoor and outdoor, which is really sick. And it's not just that, it almost seems like it's according to gravity pressure, because when you're in low grav environments, the weapons sound different as well. As for enemy sound effects, that's pretty video gamey. I wish they would call out to each other, maybe by name, like they did in Last of Us 2, or maybe gave them some personality so they didn't just seem like digital meatbags I'm about to punish in combat. I think that just comes into play with them not being very aggressive and the AI seeming kind of dumb. I know that's not related to audio design, but they sound silly and they do stupid stuff in combat as well. <sighs> I wanted a challenge here. Don't get me wrong, I did die quite a few times in my playthrough, but it was usually to some of the higher end later enemies or just me doing stupid stuff. As for the soundtrack, I was a little let down and it wasn't necessarily that it was bad, but I was kind of hoping for a Pit boy style thing where you had control of a radio with different genres or styles of music, and that doesn't exist. But furthermore than that, the soundtrack is orchestral style epic chords, which is fine for a main menu or maybe an epic cutscene. But when I'm in the middle of dialogue and the characters' voices, when they're trying to tell me important plot points, is getting overwhelmed by... That leads me to go into the settings and reduce the default music volume from 70 to 50%, which made a huge difference. It had an eerily familiar tone to Fallout. The chords didn't hit, for me at least. They didn't they didn't tickle me in the orchestral chords, so to speak. Tickle my piccolo or tweak my harp or anything. Sexual innuendos, ahoy, watch out. As for settings, there is minimal accessibility features such as low vis or colorblind alternatives and no controller dead zones. So if you have a controller that's starting to develop stick drift, you can't just taper that up and be able to play with it. But you do have several sensitivity bars for aiming down sights, hip aiming, using the menu's cursor, etc., which I do recommend tapering up just a bit because they felt sluggish at the default sense. These are my graphical settings. I have disabled motion blur because I did find it to be pretty disorienting. It is a very aggressive motion blur, which I do believe is to mask the choppiness of 30 frames per second on the console side of the house. It is recommended on the PC side of the house to run FSR2. I wasn't doing that for pretty much my whole playthrough. It was just off, so at the native resolution of 4K. And my PC was running fine, but I have like a, a beastly beast of a beastly rig. And anything less than that, 
that, I'm hearing that the frame rate's not very stable unless you activate upscaling FSR2. And this bar below it is going to be the degree of image sharpening applied. Film grain, I personally thought made the graphics look less appealing to my cornea, so I turned it off and depth of field looked good, but I did notice a little bit of frame rate chug because of it on the consoles. PC, it doesn't really matter. I can keep it on. There's also an in-game photo gallery for the photo mode. Love to see that. And then crew over here, you might think this is to manage your in-game crew or something, but it just runs the sweet sentimental credits, which you can use the mouse scroll wheel to go up and down in case you missed your buddy's name or something. As for performance, this game runs at a mostly locked 30 frames per second on the two consoles, although it did chug in major cities like New Atlantis rarely. Also, the tram taking off cutscene chugged into a freakishly low frame rate every single time I used it. So that's just like a bug or something. Also, in a couple of combat scenes when there was a lot of stuff going on on screen, bullets flying, explosions and whatnot, the frame rate did chug a bit, which when you're already at 30 frames per second, which is choppy to start, and then you get down into the mid 20s, it's definitely noticeable. There absolutely should have been a 60 FPS mode, but tapering back on graphical fidelity. It wouldn't have looked the sexiest. It wouldn't have looked as good as it did, which it did look pretty good on the Series S. I do hope that with a future update, we can unlock a 60 frame per second mode on the consoles, but I'm not hopeful for that. Some of the issues and gripes I have throughout this review easily can be remedied with a patch or update, but adding a 60 FPS mode post launch, I do not think is one of them. As for bugs, I had a handful of non-progress stopping bugs, which were mostly, well, actually almost always my companions getting caught on something and shaking around like they were having a seizure or one enemy that held his arms and his gun through the wall and I ended up killing him. There was a very annoying glitch where a black screen flash would happen every time I was taking all from enemy loot but that did seem to come and go because if that happened throughout the entire playthrough I would have been pissed. When this did start happening I would just use the scroll wheel or d-pad if you're on controller to choose what you want out of the enemy inventory while they're on the ground rather than opening up their whole inventory menu because when you hit the take all button it flashes black on the screen for a second. Along those lines since you can't have both inventories open at once you can't see or carry weight until you switch over. So many times I became over encumbered because of that. Although becoming over encumbered in this game isn't that cumbersome because you can still sprint and just burns your oxygen out. Oh, you can't fast travel either. There's also a small second long stutter whenever quick saving in real time on the PC. Maybe that's why consoles you have to go into a pause menu to quick save because they would stutter for longer. I don't know. With the controller, it is a three button press to quick save, pause, pause, quick save as where I think it should be in real time. Even on the controller, there are other games where you can bind either holding down a button or pressing two buttons at a time and it'll just quick save in real time. You don't even have to go into a menu, but there is a little chopper stutter every time you quick save on the PC in real time. As for end game or replayability, and this is an area that I do believe this title really shines, there is no multiplayer. There is a game plus mode, so when you beat it, you can carry on your progress, XP, and skills, but start with new gear and basically start a new game, but with your previous experience, so you can just build on that. A game plus mode. Or after finishing the main story, you do not have to engage that game plus mode and you can just continue to knock out side quests and whatnot, which could take you a long ass time. How much time? Well, the main story, a speedrunner beat that bitch in three hours, which is insane, but quotes on the internet are all over the place. Most outlets are agreeing on 35 to 40 hours for the main story. I am 33 hours in, done with the main story, a couple of long and in-depth side quests, dabbled with all the crafting and building mechanics, explored some barren planets, and only skipped repeat dialogue lines from NPCs that I had already spoken to or vendors, which I don't care what they're saying, so I'm just trying to sell off my shit. But let me explain. I listened to the vendors the first time I talked to them, but when I go to the same vendor 30 times in my playthrough, I ain't gonna listen to them say the same thing every time. I'm gonna skip that dialogue. There is incentive for extra playthroughs, such as doing choices to see if it affects your playthrough or running mods, which are supported but not built into the console version like Fallout 4 on the Xbox, but Bethesda stated in that showcase two months ago that mods are supported. As for the verdict, if you're looking for a deep space exploration simulator, which some are saying the marketing material pointed towards, honestly, I saw and commentated on the same showcase two months ago, and it broke out each individual mechanic explained by the person who designed it, which I love that showcase approach, and I hope that more studios do that. For example, the guy that made the shipbuilding mechanics explained how it works, and the main story director explained where they're taking that. I like that because even if you aren't the best public speaker, if you designed a system in game, you can best describe it to the world as to how it's supposed to work. Now, as we talked about in the Genesis, we talk about now in the Revelation, the ass end of the video, setting expectations. If you went into this expecting a Bethesda RPG set in space, then you're going to have a hell of a good time playing this game because the DNA is there. Your starter ship's lasers sound exactly like the Institute rifles from Fallout, but with a slightly different pitch. The storytelling, love it or hate it, all there. I personally think the main story had a good concept and the setup was nice, but how it all ties together mid to end is vague and confusing. As for pacing, I want to finish it up here because this is a huge complaint I'm hearing. People saying the game doesn't open up or get interesting until about 12 hours in. Other than the TTK being too long with early guns and the opening sequence in that cave not being crazy adrenaline packed like previous Bethesda openers, 
corners. I started my enjoyment of this game coming down that dusty, musty, crusty elevator into that dank mine, and by six hours in, I had unlocked the powers, which I'm assuming people are saying is at the 12 hour mark when they start enjoying the game. If this game isn't doing anything for you in the first few hours, brother, sister, this probably isn't the droid you're looking for. He can go about his business. Move along. Move along. And the reason I say that is this game isn't a slow burn, something like Death Stranding, which is a game that I genuinely wanted to like. I'm a huge fan of the Metal Gear Solid series. I've been playing it since I was a wee lad. I love that stuff. Been drinking it for years. But it's a game that genuinely starts slower than a river of molasses and doesn't really pick up pace until about eight hours in. I didn't get that feeling at all playing this game. Peeling back the soggy flaps of the stiffy meter. Starfield gave me a plump 7.5 in the gamer shorts. A lot of my complaints can be fixed with updates such as viewing dual inventories, increasing weapon damage, or decreasing enemy health, whatever. A little rebalancing of the TTK. Not sure about a 60 FPS mode on console post launch, but that'd be sick. Some things can't be fixed, like the surplus of loading screens, the way Way the exploration is handled, although personally, I didn't have a complaint here, but tons of people had their rovers gassed up and ready to spend hours on these moons and stars, and you can't do that. But slamming down the gavel with a verdict, this is a video game, a fun one, by a studio who stayed very close to their comfort zone, their formula. The concoction they brewed up tasted pretty good, went down relatively smooth, a little bit of a tummy ache when the story continues to add questions rather than answering them directly, but I will continue to play Starfield until I've used her up and I'm ready for the next, but it looks like I'll be spending quite a few more hours in this game, although I said the same thing for Hogwarts Legacy and Breath of the Wild, the two major releases that for me I've spent the most time in this year, and all three of these titles will have an opportunity to win Game of the Year despite none of them being perfect through my eyes. Two of them are locked at 30 frames per second on their consoles. Legacy has minimal replay value and stripped major mechanics prior to launch. Starfield's taken its licks during this review. It's a 7.5 for me, and Zelda's only playable on a tablet that was anemic in the power department six years ago, and honestly the gameplay loop got a little stale for me despite the fact that the few mechanic and trials are really fucking fun and the art style is really cool too thank you for watching drop your comments down there in the description below no not the description that's where i put words and stuff in the comment section that is where you can do whatever the hell you want but i do ask that you keep it cordial and fun down there give constructive praise or criticism and whether you like this game or not subscribe for extra fps on the rig maybe extra inches on the <clears throat> maybe it'll just get you to that 60 fps on console i actually finished the main storyline in bed on my series s final boss fight and all and it was totally fine great experience but there is a three to five minute period where when I go from my big boy PC to one of the consoles, my eyes have to adapt to going from like 120 plus frames per second to 30. Also, the graphics do look different too, but graphically, I had no complaints. The Series S and X looked gorgeous. 30 FPS sucks. I just got to turn off the video or I'm going to keep talking. Peace. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach in a system as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below. To get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of Gamer Heaven, join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where I go live every other leap year on a blue moon if it falls into an odd calendar number and my pH balance is on point. Just kidding. Starting June, I'm going to be live streaming a lot. Thanks for watching. This has been AK40 Kevin hosting Gamer Heaven, and I'll see you tomorrow because I upload daily, all the time, 60% of the time, sometimes, most of the time. Peace.